Welcome to Mike Paper Scissors. We got a um, we got another. We got a, a guest today. We got Doctor Lysandra Newton, and yes. Doctor Newton. What what are your um areas of specialty? Hello, welcome, welcome, everyone. Glad to be here. I am a physical therapist. I'm a certified uh, wellness coach, and yeah, that's that's what I do. I provide health care direct physical therapy to patients on my own providing concierge therapy to people who um, want me to work with them outside of their health insurance and then I also work for other companies providing home health services I work in a large school district here in Georgia and provide uh, services to students in the school district and then I work with clients individually who need a little help trying to figure out how they are sabotaging themselves and how they can get around you know, not taking their medications on time, that type of thing. But anything that has to do with minority health is my passion. So mm-hmm. that's what I do. Okay. I see wellness coach. Amazing. Yes. That is amazing. Yes. So as, as a wellness coach, what in, what entails a wellness coach? All right. So um, wellness coaching helps people to understand identify, first of all, if they need coaching, if they're finding that their life is out of balance. It could be relationships, finances, their health and fitness. For example, me, when I years ago couldn't understand why was I always setting up goals for myself and not able to reach them. It could be as simple as getting up an hour early or going to bed an hour early. And I realized that I'm always accepting things that I need to say no to, you know, taking on other people's challenges instead of finding out, okay, it's just okay to say no. And it's, it goes back to childhood. You know, you're supposed to do everything you're told. You're supposed to help everybody. Well, sometimes we can hurt ourselves when we're helping everyone. So it's, it's some of those things that I help people understand when getting to the root of why they're sabotaging, why they're not able to reach their goals. Um, it is a, it's a pretty moving process, um, deep process. And I work with people most of the time virtually. We'll set up Zoom meetings and we'll work together for a couple of weeks. And um, they found some benefit in it, you know, really being able to meet some challenges so they can do other things that they always had the ability to do. They just had to bring it out of themselves in order to do so. Mm. Okay. So I noticed another thing on your page. You had um, cleansing, I guess, cleanse, uh, healthy yes. eating. Healthy yes. eating. Now, that's Abdur's specialty. So he may okay. chime in a little bit more on this one. All right. Good. Good. And I heard you say, did you say vegan? You were a vegan? Um. I practice veganism from time to time. I do eat seafood a little bit, but not. I mostly okay. I don't eat really any meat at all. I try okay. to avoid as much as I can. But vacations, we'll have some some fish or maybe a shrimp yeah. there and there. Uh, yeah. We'll get something like that. But other than that, really, I don't mess with it. Yeah. Well, um, I also provide a cleanse, and there is a whole food option, a vegan option, and a paleo option. And That's people can amazing. do seven days or fourteen days or twenty one. So it's just a guided process. It's like a pre and post test, so to speak, to help you understand what your levels are, you know, what your energy is, what your weight is, all types of things. And then at the end of the process, you're able to compare and notice um, the the success you've had. There's a lot of um, wealth of information, a journal, a workbook. It's just a lot of information, what to buy, how to release toxins from your body. It's it's really a a lot of information. And uh, I enjoy doing that. Okay. Okay. That's amazing. So, um, so I, I have a question real quick. I mean, I sure. know that in dealing um, with our people, you see a lot of um, habits that we have that yeah. attribute to a lot of the comorbidities that a, a lot of people in the black community have. Yeah. Um, by using utilizing some of your coaching and practices, have you seen um, any of those comorbidities subside? Have you seen a lot of improvement or is it just a matter of each individual being willing to commit 
as far as what they're doing in their their individual lives, be it diet, exercise, whatever the case may be? It's really a combination. And that's a great question. I'm going to tell you a short story about a patient I had, a home health patient. I was seeing her because she had a stroke. This is an African-American woman in her mid to late 70s. She lived in a multi-story home. There's steps to get up to the front, then steps to get up to the living kitchen area in her in her bedroom. And I uh, was, again, seeing her because she had a stroke. But she had to show up because she had hypertension, which is, you know, a, a risk factor for strokes. This patient, every time I would come to see her, we make a schedule, her and I. And she would either have to have one of the children uh, in the house come let me in, or she would sit there and wait for me and struggle down the stairs. Long story short, you know, sometimes I get to her, she, you know, she, her blood pressure is so, so high, I wanted to call EMS. And she hadn't eaten, she hadn't slept, or she slept too much. But the, the point is that she knew, knew how to control her um, hypertension, but she couldn't take her medication because she couldn't get her meals on time. She mm-hmm. couldn't get her meals on time because she was at home by herself. Mm. But her family had to work. You know, you, you know, it, it was just, just one of those situations where there's a lot of, of issues involved. And so I had to work with her, but also work with her family. Let's let's figure out, can we get some a neighbor in here? Can we get, you know, an aunt or somebody, a cousin, you know, throughout the day, every day, somebody has to come here and, and help her because otherwise she's going to have another stroke. And, and this, it may be one she's not able to recover from. You know, there's some people who don't do the right thing just because it's hard for them to do. Or like you were talking about, you go on vacation and you eat seafood sometimes. There's some things people don't want to push away from because right. it's cultural or it's habitual. But um, we, we have to just coach each other, you know, support each other, be role models and examples for each other to make better choices. When we have the information, just like wearing seat belts and, and using car seats. There was a time we didn't do that. But we know better, so we do better. Right. I have a question. Okay. Sure. Um, do you feel like um, class and like income levels have a, a an effect on people's ability to reach their target goals as far as health? I do. You feel I like do. It's like and it's, a direct line, right? Yeah. It, it is so structural. Um, you know, another example: um, patient who can't. You know, they're on a fixed income. They're living in a, 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 an apartment complex for, for senior citizens. They have no car and again, nobody to take them somewhere. They, they're not able to get transportation. They have to call 72 hours to get it. Maybe their insurance covers it. Maybe they have the copay to pay. Maybe they don't. They have to ask someone to take them. Somebody wants to charge them $30. They only have $50 left for the month. Yeah. That's a, that's a real time example. Even, wow. even um, insurance where, where people can't pay, by the time we had the um, Obamacare, that helped a lot because it cut down on all the co-pays and some of the things like just getting a physical every year, especially for women where we couldn't do th- things like that, we had to pay for. Now it's, it's, it's equal to what it should be, but people just, just can't afford it. Or if there's lack of access in certain types of certain communities, and it's usually minority communities where you don't have um, the, you have an urgent care, but you don't have a hospital. You don't have enough doctor's offices. The doctor's offices have patients out the door. You can't get an appointment. You can't get an emergency appointment. Um, it's just our veterans, you know, it's most, mostly those can get their medications, but they have to go up there and stand all day. But definitely um, our income level and the communities that we live in that are don't have the exposure, don't have the access, which is in my at this point, I feel it's deliberate because you know, why else? Why haven't we caught up? So you see, you see the disparities in the healthcare with us, like you see it. I do firsthand. Right. Yeah, I do. Wow, I do. It, it's 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 very challenging, but um, I'm thankful. I'm thankful whatever space that God put me in to whoever whoever I can. I'm very thankful, and I do what I can. You know, and there's people out here, lots of people doing the same thing. But, you know, when it's your own and you look at someone like, oh, that's my Nana, that's my grandma. uh, Wow. You know, you start feeling, taking it (laughs) personal, you know, I'm feeling it. Well, thank you for the work you do. Oh, thank you. Well, I know it's a thankless job. You know, I have a lot of family in healthcare and and, and all variations from mental health 
Um, my wife's a mental health oh, director yeah. and my sister, yeah. you know what I mean, in the nursing program, and she's doing the same thing, health and wellness, yeah. and, and trying to get people in, and we see a lot of the same things. It's a direct line to poverty and our health, and, it, and it, it, it's really harmful to us. And yeah. we need to get the proper information to people and, and make eating good and eating well, you know, the thing to do. You know? But, you know, our our people, we've been eating bad for so long. Like we accept that right. as the norm. Yeah, we at, at this point, just to say it's a like, habitual is almost an understatement. Right. Yeah. But again, so, well, you know, one like, of the things that I have done um, with the cleanse is work with groups. So I'm starting one now when I have um, one of my cousins and her her mom, my aunt, doing it together. I've worked with teachers. I've worked with, you know, other people's families and they do it together as a team. So they know, okay, we're going to do whole foods, for example. These are the foods we're going to eat. We can, you know, this is how we can spice it up safely. We don't need this much salt. We just need a little bit of this, that, you know what I mean? And everybody doing it together, then it becomes something that you can, you can coach each other on and remind each other about. And so when you, 4th of July comes, you know, the, you presenting things that everybody can eat and it's, it's healthy and it's a it's something that we shouldn't expect to be able to tackle all at once but we do just get little bits and pieces along the way to, to make small improvements we can get there well you you being in the south and Brock being in the south I mean and we you know us we know Soul food <laughs> restaurants are in abundance in the south, yes. and <laughs> yes, very and much so. Sweet tea. And we <laughs> yes. soul the food restaurants is, and barbecue. And the thing yeah. is, yeah. the thing is, though, what what I've discovered is you can still have the soul food. See, everything I found out there's an option that you could eat unhealthy. There's actually a healthy option for it. things we just don't know mm-hmm. the opposites for it, the healthy things. So everything that I find when I go to cookouts, you know, when you don't eat meat, you have to come prepared. And a lot of times, you know, I'm, I'm at a cookout now. So I have mm-hmm. to, we brought our own food. Like my wife made like a dirty quinoa. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. She made, um, you know, we bring our fresh veggies to put on the grill. You know what I mean? She mm-hmm. made a vegan mac and cheese. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. there's things that you can do. And it's not like completely healthy, but it's not the abundance of junk that normally go in. And then you start to learn all of these different recipes. And you say, oh, there's something different than sweet potatoes. You can actually have, you know, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm having a slip of the mind. Um, not a, yeah, like not a yeah, not a yeah, not a sweet potato, but um, a squash. You can have butternut, oh, yeah. you can have butternut squash as an offset instead of French fries. You can have, you know, yucca, yucca fries. There's different things that you can have that's yeah. better for your body that you learn that you can still get yeah. the same soulful food feeling from it and the comfort food feeling from it and not do as much damage to your body. And I think that's been yeah. the biggest part of my journey. But it takes it takes money. Like I'm in a grocery store every two days oh, buying fresh fruits and vegetables. Oh I stay in a grocery yeah. store. Like every two days, every two days, I go and buy stuff. I make a big salad every few days, and that's like my baseline. And then we have food. So even if you don't have something good, there's always that salad to pull off of. You know what I'm saying? You don't yeah. feel like making something, you make a salad, you put a little something on the side with it. But we don't. We have to retrain ourselves how to make food and how to cook and how we to do. eat and put certain things in our body. And again, like some of the things was the information on there's certain foods that target certain parts of your body. You know what I'm saying? So you eat certain things if you have inflammation in your body. You don't have to take the ibuprofen. You can take, you don't put a little turmeric in your food. You know what I'm saying? Mm, And and do certain herbs and stuff like that that I've learned. So there's things where you can stop putting all the junk and the chemicals in your body, but we just, and then we got to stop villainizing people that try to teach and make it seem like, you know, they're the weirdos for trying to teach somebody something (laughs) good and start promoting these people. You know what I'm saying? They're saying they're mm-hmm. trying to help. They're trying to teach you, and then just take it in small increments. Don't try to do it. You know, we jump off the cliff with as black people sometimes, where we're going all in vegan. I did. I'm going all vegan, and I went and spent two thousand dollars on groceries. And oh I looked, gosh. and I was like, I'm like, I can't, I can't spend. I can't. We're not a family no. that has five hundred dollars for almond milk a month. Like, <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, so, you, you, right. so we was like, we're, we can't dive all the way in like that. Let's find out what works. And it took a few years, and now we found a baseline. But as long as you keep working at it, like I tell people, if you want to stop eating meat, don't just stop eating meat. Maybe do five meals or four meals with no meat, or three meals no meat, and do the rest mm-hmm. with meat. And it starts to slowly mm-hmm. say, all right, now this week I'm not going to do chicken. This week, I'm not going to do steak. Then maybe you say, you know what, that was pretty good. Maybe I don't do either. And then figure out what works for you. And I just feel like, you know, we just should try new things like that. 
it's all about balance. And like you at this at the cookout, a question for you: Do people ask you if they can try like your your the foods that you brought? Like they the do. Mac and cheese. They do. They're weird about it first because as soon as they hear vegan, it's almost like you 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 you, put, you spread dirt on your food. But what they're oh finding gosh. out is if a person can cook, it don't matter what they're cooking; they just can cook. And my wife, mm-hmm. I've been blessed; she can actually cook. So we mm-hmm. we we transition a lot of people because she can cook. You know what I yeah, mean? I'm gonna I'm be real with you, man. I mean, you know, maybe it's the the southerner in me. When you said vegan mac and cheese, you kind of lost me. But oh. but 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 <laughs> just being real. When you said dirty quinoa, I'm like, oh, I want to try some dirty quinoa. It? <laughs> right. And it, it, like, it, oh. say, it hits on, on the same notes. It hits on all the same notes. The thing is, our, our, our taste buds have been hijacked with salt and, and um, oh, yeah. food and flavor enhancers and, and sugar. And that's another thing. I detoxed from sugar for a month, and then a carrot tastes like I was drinking, you know, I was eating a, a piece of candy. You know, a, a cherry mm-hmm. tomato tastes like I was eating a Jolly Rancher because mm-hmm. once you detox from all the junk, you can actually really taste food how it's supposed to taste. And I actually lost my mind on fresh fruits and veggies because I was almost tasting stuff for the first time again after almost my whole life. I didn't realize. And I was going to people like, taste this tomato like a weirdo. <laughs> taste this. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, yo, dude, it's a tomato. I'm like, nah, it, it, it's so sweet. It's so fresh. It's crunchy. And it's like, yeah, what's wrong with this guy? <laughs> Why is he so excited about a tomato? My my guy. It's just a tomato, my guy. (laughs) Chris watched my transition, a lot of it coming out the barbershop, you know what I mean? So he saw, like, really the transition from the point where I got to having a little bit of understanding. I try to share a little bit here and there, but you don't want to be too overbearing and feel like you're preaching. And I don't want to preach to people. I just want to let them know you have an alternative if you want one. Yeah. You know? Sugar, sugar. We got to leave that sugar alone. Yeah. Learn, learn to love agave. Diet. Yeah. 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 Oh, there's a whole bunch of uh, there's a whole bunch of alternatives to sugar, but to tell a black person <laughs> that's making that that red Kool Aid that you cannot oh use God. three quarters of this bag of Domino oh. sugar, they not hearing that. Yeah, you know what? At that point, just let the Kool Aid go. Just, just leave the Kool Aid. Yeah, right, right. All, all of the above. The Kool Aid pack and the sugar. It's like, look at what we're drinking. We're drinking yeah. sugar and a pack of the red dye. Right. And bragging yeah, about who can make it water. the sweetest. Right. Who can make it the most right, serious? Right. <laughs> I, I got a friend of mine who um brags that his Kool Aid is crunchy. It's so much sugar in it that when he Lord. stirs it up, oh it's God. crunchy. He got the crunchy. Can't Kool-Aid. even dissolve all yeah, of it. Okay, right. Right. Give me a, that's, head, that's that's headache syrup. There you go. <laughs> you see, and see, as black people, we brag about unhealthy oh, yeah. shit. Yeah. <laughs> we like eating eating all that fried chicken, fried pork chops. Um. God knows what else. Like we brag about that. Like all that that thick ass macaroni and cheese with four cheeses. That shit's no, not good. It tastes for you. good, but it ain't good it's for not, you. It it's not no. good. It's glue for the body. That's what it. That's what it does on your guts, man. It turns Make it off. It, all those organs stick together. Yeah. yeah. And blood blood clogs up, man. Next thing you know, that, that, your heart is like, oh wait a minute, hold yo, up, I can't work anymore. Cheese and sugar are probably the worst, man. <laughs> Cheese and so, sugar, and that was the hardest thing to get rid of for me was the was the cheese, the last thing I let go. So my my other question for you is this: When dealing with our community, do you see yourself having more of a difficult time with um, the older set of our community, and are the the younger ones a little more open to some of the ideas that you have in reference to health and wellness? Um, it depends. So some of the younger ones are open um, to trying new things and, you know, tasting new things and having a new thought press, a thought process about when to eat, what to eat. Older ones, it just depends on their level of independence. If they are solely dependent upon their family, you know, then they really are, are more reluctant to make changes because they don't want to rock the boat. They feel like, oh, well, my daughter and my son-in-law are taking care of me or my niece is taking care of me and I don't want to ask them to cook this for me and they have to cook this for themselves or I don't always have enough left, left over in my social security so I don't want to make be a burden on them. It just depends on the situation and that's why clinicians really, you, you're, you're, you're being reimbursed for working with one person in the family but 
if you're a minority and you really feel like this is your calling, you have to work with the whole family. You just, it just, you have to work with everybody. I, I got a question for you, doctor. Mm -hmm. Now, I, so you're a physical yes. therapist. Do you have, is, do you have a problem with, I ain't gonna say a problem. Do you have a hard time getting black people to, to come see you? No, I don't. It, it, it's just, no? it depends if they, I mean, because I go to them, my students in, in school, you know, I go to them and the patients that I see home health, I go to them. They've had, they've had something, a heart, heart attack, or a stroke or broken a hip or something and their doctor refers them. And then a lot of times I'll have people I've worked with before, they'll request me if something happens to another family member or the same person, or even if they don't have an insurance, I'm um, working with in insurance, they'll ask me to work with them on another level for like um, help them modify the house, uh, what cabinets to use because grandma keeps falling every time she goes to the bathroom. You know, should we take up this, you know, I would even look on the computer, you know, they're walking through the house and, and show me what's going on and we can talk about what's, what to do. So it, I don't have trouble. I think once I get in front of them, I really don't have trouble. But, but patients have trouble accessing care in general. And I want to say minority patients definitely have, ac have difficulty with access because they'll, they'll do it if, if the doctor prescribes it and if their insurance covers it. But it's that part. It's getting to the doctor. It's getting eight visits instead of four visits. You know, that's yeah. that's where the challenge lies that I see. Uh, all right, that disparity with the home yep. with the health care. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. tell us um tell us about um before we finish finish up with that, tell us about the um the cleanse you got going on. Yeah, right now I'm doing a Whole Foods cleanse cleanse that starts next Wednesday and it's a seven day Whole Foods cleanse and it's I like to do things as a group, as I said, because I feel like people have um, better success when they have a, somebody that can hold them accountable and somebody that, that they can converse with about what they're doing. And so if anyone wants to go to my wealth, um, website, which is cptwellness.com, and the C stands for covenant, the P, P stands for physical, and the T stands for therapy. So it's cptwellness.com and you click on the cleanse tab, you'll see um, all the different cleanses that you could do. The one I'm doing, though, is a, that I'm doing as a group is, a, is the seven day that starts on Wednesday, Whole Foods. Okay, okay. But you can do it anytime you want to. Exactly. I'm going to check oh, that yeah. out. Oh, I, I already checked website. out your website, so yeah, I'll definitely go. Oh, good. Yeah. Good, good, good. Okay. No, I appreciate the work you're doing. I really do. It's, it, we don't, you know, we were looking for even like um, mental health experts out here for the black community. And I think it's like finding a unicorn, you know, oh, there's, yeah. there's so many like disparities and holes in the, in the, in the health system for, all, for, for us and our people. And it's like the fact that you're out there fighting every day is, is I'm def I definitely appreciate what you're doing. Well, thank you. That's good. You got to get those. Thank you. Yes, sometimes yes. You keep going. <laughs> And I appreciate it. Okay. Now, Mr. Brock. Yes, sir. All right. You you had a you had an issue you wanted you wanted to discuss. Oh man. Um I'm I'm curious to know where everybody stands on this. And this was something that was weighing on me. Um because I feel like I should be wholeheartedly behind this. But I'm curious to know what everybody's take or feelings are in regards to the Black Lives Matter movement. <laughs> and what in particular? What in particular? Just, just, just every everything that it entails. Um, if if you like, I can go ahead and give you my my spiel. But I I, I would really like to hear where everyone else stands before I really go off on this tangent. Can I? I can start. <laughs> and I and I, right. under, and I understand ahead, the reason why you kind of want to. I don't want to say tiptoe into it. Uh, because, yeah. Because, you know, I, I, I get what your point is because from my perspective is you don't want to say it's it's something you don't want to get behind because it's almost like what else are we going to get behind in a, in a sense. But then right. you know, like everything, everything for me is who is backing this thing. So I always look to where the dollar comes from. And I'm really big personally on if it's a black movement or or – a movement for our people that should be funded and supported only by us. 
There shouldn't be any outside influence at all whatsoever. So if there's outside influences that aren't our own people and aren't funded by our own dollar, I really can't see how it can ultimately end up being for us. There's always another agenda, especially if somebody's funding it. We see it in the NAACP. We've seen it in um, almost every black organization that comes through. When the money's not our own, then it gets dictated a certain way or it gets watered down. And you can actually see what's happening right now. It almost feels like everything's going to get watered down. It's all going to become a token tokenized and, and monetized for profit, and it's going to be the it thing, but we're not going to get a lot of tangibles out of it. So I'm looking at this movement, and I'm seeing, you know, you know, Paw Patrol guys getting taken off, and I'm seeing that, you know, Netflix is doing things, and Ben and & Jerry's is doing things, and that's all good. It's good for people to have awareness, but I want to know what tangibles are we getting, what laws, what policies, what are, what are they doing, where are they at at the table, what senators are they talking to? What laws are getting moved? What are they moving on? And I'm not hearing any of that. With it. So I could be naive to it and not looking deep enough into it. You know, and I, I, I have a little bit into it, but not really as much as I really should. So I don't want to kind of badmouth them too much, but there's a feeling I got like the ship isn't being steered only by us. And I feel bad that I feel that way, but I do. I don't wholeheartedly support them. Okay. So. All right. What the, you want to say something, Sean, before I go? <laughs> well, I do know that the um, um, the House is planning to propose to vote on a bill this week um, that has to do with uh, protections for people, you know, banning chokehold and um, other, you know, different negotiation things about how there's no immunity for a police officer to be able to say, well, I felt in fear for my life. They can no longer, they, they can no longer use that as a defense. As it is right now, they, that's an automatic defense that they're protected from where they want to change the law to where the police officer has to prove it. It's not just a given. Um, so that is something that's coming forward. I know that the Senate has already, the only African-American Senator, Tim Scott, I can't remember what um, state he represents. They're putting him up there to try to come up with something. But what the Senate is doing is like little baby steps and kind of like, let's gloss this over. The House is more comprehensive. It seems like, well, you know, the House, of course, is going to, you know, we're the Democrats are um, the majority. So they'll pass it. But then when it goes to the Senate, what's going to happen? But but even that seems, hold on, real quick, just... We're not only criminal justice reform, and that's we always get a a, a two percent little increment forwardness on criminal justice reform. It seems like that's the thing to do. We always get a little a little bit there, and then but there's all the other things, even the health and wellness and the and the healthcare and nothing else ever changes. And again, I don't know what else is on the agenda. So for me to get behind this movement, it feels like it can't just be. We're all not, you know, and I don't mean to say this in a facetious way, but it's like we're all not criminals. That's a small portion of our yeah. people. But that's always the main target. Like all black people want is criminal justice reform, and it's all good. No, I want I want other things, and it's, that's a small part of it. Yeah, we get railroaded, but again, that can't be the main thing. It can't be the main topic all the time. Yeah, Abdur, that's that's one of my issues. Is I'm about a, an right. agenda. So if we're gonna if we're gonna protest, we're gonna do this. Okay, that's fine. I'm I have no issue with that. But what's our, what's our agenda, like? I I was re- I was reading the um of the Martin Luther King the letter Birmingham mm-hmm. letter mm-hmm. from Birmingham I mean but you, yeah. you know what I'm talking about the letter mm-hmm. they wrote in jail mm-hmm. I was reading that and he was describing his agenda like okay we're gonna do a, a, a nonviolent protest to and we're gonna then do this do this and this he had an agenda on how to get the effective change that they went for and I feel like that's what this movement needs to do. But I don't think their, I don't think their their agenda is is, is transparent. Right. At least it doesn't feel that way. And I don't think it's um it's a broad thing. There are some communities that are making changes. You know, like here in Atlanta, the mayor you know made some changes that are just relevant here in Atlanta. The different mayors are doing things different. The governor in New York, you know, changed some. It's it's just. It's, there's nothing that is broad sweeping all 50 states and for me I just can speak for myself I need to be active on my local even though my kids are, no, are in the public school go to the local school board and, and, and see what policies they have or you know um, 
to the city council and see what 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 policies they have and see what it is that I can do to, to lend my voice and what do I see that affects people and like you talked about mental health you're saying one of you was saying that you have people who are mental health professional in your family when people talk about defunding the police they're not saying we don't need police officers what they're saying is instead of giving for example five million dollars to the police department in this whatever precinct give them three and then give one to have mental health counselors come to, to talk to a person who is uh, inebriated in their car or this person who is is naked like the other gentleman who was killed he was he was uh, schizophrenic he needed a mental health counselor, not a police officer to right, show up right. because, you know, so, so, so taking some resources that you're sending police officers to tackle issues, which with a gun, which is not what is needed to address the situation, sending the appropriate person because we de- we defund schools. We don't provide uh, yep. proper funding for schools or education. We don't provide where well, we talked about health care, mental health. I mean, that's just been neglected for so long, for so long now. I'm going to hit this. Y'all. I totally agree with everything that you all are saying. But for me, I really dug into some stuff. There was some stuff sitting on my spirit that I was feeling and I actually felt bad about in regards to just the overarching idea of the movement. Um, and I felt so much, I felt so bad about it that I, I went down to a protest just to see if all right, I need to go down here, get in, you know, get in the trenches and see if my feelings change. And my feelings didn't. And my feelings are this, y'all. I'm a proud black man. Very proud. I look in the mirror and I see greatness. I have a house with beautiful black children, a beautiful black wife. I have a house full of just beautiful black people. I have a family full of black excellence. The doctor, um, the doctor right here is a shining example. Sean is a, shi- a shining example of black excellence. My brothers that are on the on the line with me now, strong black men. That said, if I'm downtown or in anybody's city and I'm down here and I'm yelling Black Lives Matter to random whoever, who am I trying to convince? All right. My that that's what that's that's the, the question that kept popping up in my head. Why am I yelling? The black lives that we're we're on the on the line with now, y'all matter to me. The black lives in my home matter to me. That black life that I see in the mirror every morning matters to me. So why do I need to go out and scream in some random white person's face and say black lives matter like they're going to say, oh, you know what? You're right. You do matter. Rather, that's not going to happen. So that that said, I, I, I really I feel like I'm trying to force someone to like and accept me that doesn't like and accept me. And I wasn't raised to do that. I'm not built like that. The way that I see is this, you don't have to like me. You, you don't, you don't have to like the color of my skin, the kink in my hair, the color of my eyes, the roundness of my lips, or how wide my nose is. What you do have to do is this for me, either a help me or B get the hell out of my way. That's what I want. I don't need you to feel like Black Lives Matter. You don't have to. Just don't get in my way. I don't have to convince you to like me because if you don't like me for the color of my skin, cool. I, I want you to show your overt racism. I don't want this, this, this quiet closet racist. Show me your overt racism so that I can use the tools that are at my disposal now, i.e. social media, our podcasting platforms, and everybody that I know to affect your dollars. Because as Abdur says, at the end of the day, it's about blood and money. So that being the case, I don't care about convincing somebody who needs convincing that black lives matter. What, who are we trying to convince? Rather than getting this, stirring this movement up and running down wherever to our respective city halls and saying black lives matter, how about we go down there and say, Black economics matter. Right. Because at the end of the day, all right, I'm, I'm going to say something that's probably going to rub people the wrong way, but at this point, it's, it's been sitting with me so long now that I don't care. I, although race is a huge issue in this country, I don't think, if you, as, as Chris says, once you unpack all of this, I think it's deeper than race. 
I don't think race is the issue. I think that the issue is economics. The issue is social classes. Uh-huh. So if we we as a collective actually started practicing group F, group economics and putting our money together, we could build a foundation. And with that foundation, you know what we could do once we have a, a economic base? We could start um, going to politicians and saying, look, we don't care if you're Democrat, Republican, whatever you are, this is what we want. Now you have that. You're leaving no, no, on philosophy. Ron, it, 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 <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, oh, I, I know. No, but, uh, no, hear me out. Let hey. me finish this. Let me finish this. This is what we want. Whether we have, well, whether we can put enough funding together to buy that politician and or rent that politician for a term, mm. this is what we want. This is what, what are you going to do for us as a collective, not short-sighted for the long term? What are you going to do? If you got us, we got you. Now we get behind you and now what can we do? We can start working our way into the judicial system. Once we have politicians, we have access to judges. And if we get judges in our pocket, guess who won't mess with us no more? Our asses won't be out there getting beat down by the police because who controls them? The judicial system. We need to get our economics together. Yeah. Black economics should matter more than us running out trying to convince white people that black lives matter. If it don't, if my black life don't matter to you, it ain't gonna matter to you if I'm standing in front of your store yelling at the top of my lungs. However, if I have an economic base behind me, guess what? I start to matter a little more. Um, I think I said this on a pod before. I don't think that it's that they are afraid of us. I don't. I don't think they value us, and they don't value us because we, although we have, we pour into this economy. I don't know how much of a percentage. We hold of our, our our nation's total economy, but it's a huge chunk. If we were able to take those dollars and focus them in on black issues, I can assure you black lives will matter. Black lives mattering will be a byproduct of black economics. Matter. Well, you're seeing it now. The fear is just retracting. That's the thing. You're, you're actually speaking mm-hmm. to what you're seeing right now. That's the fear. So that's why they're trying to monetize and everybody's trying to be on paper and that's why you say you don't want it to be disingenuous. I'd rather the racist be in my face. I want that guy, not the guy that's in the closet, you know what I'm saying, doing the, the worst kind of work. I'd rather everybody be up front and let's take our ball and go home. We discussed that last time. Like, we do not need anything that they have to offer if we do it ourselves. But again, exactly. we always want what they have. And the thing is, we don't want to build our own. So it's, it's a mindset thing. Everything you said was on the money and exactly right and exactly what we should be doing. And I agree with you on Black Lives Matter. On, on, on all the above. I just argued somebody down why I didn't agree with um, a black guy on Facebook saying, um, it was a black guy saying, I'm human, I'm a father. And I was like, I don't, not liking a cosign, and I don't got to explain to nobody my value set. We've been explaining that to people for the last men 100 years after, you know what I'm saying, segregation. Why are we doing this still? I don't want to do that no more. You know what I'm saying? So, right. like I said, it's blood and money. It's always blood and money. So let's get our money together and retract it. What you're seeing is they felt an effect from the NFL being retracted. That's why the NFL came out the way they did. And these other stores have felt an effect. So now everybody's concerned and worried about being, uh, you know, blackballed by the black community because we put so much money into everybody but us. Yeah. Everybody gets That's a piece of ours. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, but, Abdur, you know, you know white, superior, white superiority system is a system that is designed to keep black people disenfranchised and economically at the bottom of the love of the of the game. That's, that's their plan. That's why I'm loving the spook who sat by the door. That's why I'm rereading it now. Because it's like what's it called? Spook who sat by the door about okay. um Freeman. And he's a he's a, he started off in politics and real quick, if y'all guys don't know, and it goes from him starting off in politics and this white politician has this black guy to be like his connection to the black community and he pretty much says i need something because i'm losing the black vote and what can we do and they're like well the cia doesn't have any black representation as um, an officer so if you bring that up it'll look like you're fighting for the black community and they'll rally behind you so what he does is put the guy the black guy into the cia program and this guy ends up long story short learning everything, being out all the bourgeoisie black people who was going in there just to be integrationists, because this happened in the 60s, and they're just in there just to have prestige, but they don't care about the black people on the bottom. They just care about being away from the black people on the bottom, and he's there to actually learn everything that he can from the system and put it back into the black community. And what he ends up doing is taking what he learned and going into the community 
and he's a spy for the CIA, and they think that they're spying on his black people, but what he's doing is giving black people the game and literally telling mm. white people something different. And and, and, it's, mm. and he's building these young black men who are gangs now, and he's turning them into, like, these black leaders. And he's teaching them value, and he's saying, everything that's in my house, you think it's, like, white art. These are black people made this. Black, this is black music I'm listening to. These are black historians. These are black designers. This is black clothing. You know what I'm saying? This is black artwork. You are valued. You are special. He's putting these into these young men. He's like, now I love these men, and I don't know, I wasn't supposed to, because I was really supposed to be detached just to do a job. And now he's seeing them grow. He's like, I turn them from these angry, black, nothings into people that have pride in themselves, and they're willing to risk their lives for other people. And it's just a beautiful thing. And I put a post on where our freemen's at, because there's no freemen among us. It's like, we need people that really care enough to do the real hard work that goes unseen. And um, right now it's just who's going to do that. And like I said, before we can even get started, we don't even have even people we can point to to do these things. You know, so mm-hmm. it's tough. We have to start with, start ourselves. What, what else can we it, do? When, we're doing it now. You know. And, and I and I want to <laughs> speak on that. I mean, I know that the the plan is to keep us suppressed. But um, in the words of my man, Mike Tyson, everybody got a plan until they get hit. <laughs> you know, so, you know, that being the case, we need to hit back and we don't need to hit back running around, you know, running around yelling in people's faces. We need to hit them where it matters. And that is economically. That, that's e- economics would be the freedom that we're looking for. Economics would be the inclusion that we're looking for. And to be perfectly honest, I think that we we, we kind of hustling backwards if you look at it, because the, you know, in any civilized society, you're gonna have class levels, and that being the case, you cannot expect to get full social equality if you don't have economic equality. Yeah. And, and does it now morally that doesn't sound like it should be true. But I'll just give you an example of my industry, and I'm sure everyone has an example of theirs. The people who get treated the best in my industry are the doctors. You know why? The doctors bring in the money. Right. Now, mm-hmm. those doctors can't necessarily fulfill their jobs without nurses and technicians and everyone else. But a, a nurse or a technician can truthfully get shit on. And they kind of like, all right, look, man, look, you're just going to have to take that one on the chin because... You know how Dr. So-and-so is. Meanwhile, the doctor can, you know, just be just a a straight up ass to anybody, but kind of gets a pass because of what they bring to their individual facilities. It's a class level. And more often than not, we socially rank people in line with what they do, what they do monetarily or in this case, economics. So you can't sit, um, you can't sit here and expect to get social equality when black people have yet to get economic equality. It, it just doesn't add up. I don't disagree. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. I mean, you know, we can keep this going, mm-hmm. but, you know, we got to cut it short. <laughs> I appreciate y'all coming on. Doctor, I appreciate you, and hopefully we can have sure. you back. Um. Abby Brock, you know, we can we can chop it up another time. We can continue this another day. We absolutely got to run it back. Nice, speaking <laughs> with you. nice to talk to you, doctor. I appreciate you. Thank you. You all, too. Uh, all right. Thank y'all for listening. Peace. We out. Have a good night. Peace.